in second grade, they should teach kids not to believe every stupid thing they think. But I believe every stupid thing I think. <laughs> <laughs> no one had ever taught me that thoughts lie. Really? Yeah. What does an orgasm require? Attention. Attention. Mm -hmm. Got to pay attention to the feeling long enough to sort of make it happen. Love your brain. Nobody loves their brain. Why? Because you can't see it. You can see the wrinkles in your skin or the fat around your belly. You can do something when you're unhappy with it. But when you see your brain, oh my goodness, you fall in love. And it's like, I want that better. Welcome back to the Rena Malik MD podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Rena Malik, urologist and pelvic surgeon. Today, our guest is Dr. Daniel G. Amen. He is a leading psychiatrist and brain health expert. He's written over 40 books, with 11 of them being New York Times bestsellers. And he's got a new book coming out this March about raising mentally strong kids. We talk today about what a disciplined mind is. What are some warning signs of deteriorating brain health? How can your brain affect your sex life and your relationships? And what can you do to make your relationships better just by using your brain? We talk about how to optimize sexual intimacy and desire. And as Dr. Amen being one of the only psychiatrists in the country who scanned over 250,000 brains using SPECT scanning, we talk about why it is that people are not modifying clinical practice to uptake these imaging protocols. So I hope you enjoy today's discussion. It's a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Thank you so much. So you talk about brain health. And what I'm curious is, what do you mean by a disciplined mind? What is a disciplined mind? And should we be aiming to have one? So it's a mind that you're in control of, rather than it throws you around by you believe every stupid thing you think. It's your body's out of control because your mind is undisciplined and out of control. So how do you know when your mind is undisciplined? Um, if your thoughts tend to hurt you, they tend to be mean to you. If uh, you can't sleep, if you're anxious, if you're sad, and you've never really thought about your own mind. Now the brain, the physical function of your brain creates your mind but in second grade they should teach kids not to believe every stupid thing they think yeah and i was 28 years old in my psychiatric residency at the walter reed army medical center when one of our professors said you have to teach your patients not to believe every stupid thing they think and I'm like, but I believe every stupid thing I think. <laughs> that no one had ever taught me that thoughts lie. They lie a lot, and it's your undisciplined, unquestioned thoughts that create the most suffering. And so with all of my patients, I think of it like basic training, right? I was in the army for 10 years, so I use military analogies. Um, it's just like basic training, like foundational knowledge. Is your mind helping you or is it hurting you? And if it's hurting you, how can you, like you discipline a child, not being mean, but being clear and kind and firm mm -hmm. with yourself, right? I'm also a child psychiatrist, and I have a new book coming in March called Raising Mentally Strong Kids. And the two words that go with effective parenting are firm, when you say something, mean it, back it up, um, and kind, do it in a loving way. But you can never be a good parent if you're not a good parent to yourself. That is really impactful. And I think a lot of us spend so much time thinking that we have to give, give, give to everyone else, but we're not looking inward and taking care of our own health, whether it's brain health or otherwise, right? We're not actually giving ourselves a priority. 
And that affects everything we do, including the children we raise. No question about it. And so many mothers I see, um, they spend so much time taking care of other people that they end up worn out and bitter because they've neglected their inner child, if you will, that has often been neglected or abused. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I take care of women in my practice and I take care of things like quality of life, like incontinence and prolapse. And these things can really be detrimental. In fact, I was just talking to my husband recently about how sad it is that people who have urinary leakage don't leave the house and how they need that social connection. But these women will have incontinence for years and years and years to the point where it's gotten so bad, they finally come see me. And when I asked them, you know, what was stopping you from coming earlier? Well, it was my kids, my parents, my job, my everything else that took priority over my health. And it actually negatively impacts all of those other people. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because if you're not happy, if my wife is not happy, it leaks. Mm -hmm. No pun intended, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, and I think you said it somewhere in a podcast before, but we have a moral obligation to try to have healthy brains and try to be prioritizing our health so that we positively impact the people around us. Well, it's actually in my book, You Happier, which I love that book so much, because uh, I got to spend a year writing about, researching, thinking about happiness. And I open the book with a quote from Dennis Prager that happiness is a moral obligation. And I grew up Roman Catholic, and I'm very happy I grew up that way. It gave me a solid moral foundation but that idea that happiness is a moral obligation was missing in my childhood. Yeah. Um, Cause it was like, oh, that's wrong, that's bad, that's selfish. Now hedonism is the enemy of happiness cause it'll wear out the nucleus accumbens, it'll wear out your pleasure centers in your brain. But when you ask people what really makes them happy, it's, it's not hedonistic behavior, it's mm -hmm. connection, it's purpose, it's learning, it's growing, um, it's having a path. And so another foundational exercise I do with all of my patients is called the one page miracle. On one piece of paper, write down what you want, but do it in a very structured, specific way. What do you want in your relationships? Like with my wife, I want a kind, caring, loving, supportive, passionate relationship. Always want that. Don't always feel like that. Rude thoughts show up, but I don't say them because it doesn't fit what I want. Mm -hmm. What do you want with your children? What do you want with your friends? What do you want with your money? Very important question to ask uh, so you don't get thrown around by advertisers. Um, what do you want with work, with your physical health, your emotional health, your spiritual health? On one piece of paper, write this down and then ask yourself, does it fit? Does my behavior fit the goals I have for my life? And that's a brain exercise, right? The front third of your brain is called the prefrontal cortex, largest in humans than any other animal by far. Um, if you exercise that, because it's involved with forethought, judgment, decision-making, planning, you gotta tell it what you want. And then behavior becomes more purposeful. So if under physical, I want a healthy brain, I'm not drinking alcohol because it won't make it healthy. And I'm not eating bad food. Another thing to sort of write down for people who are listening, only love food that loves you back, right? You're in a relationship. And I don't know if you've ever been in a bad relationship, but I have, and I'm not doing it anymore. I'm just not. I'm married to my best friend, and at work and at my life, I have the no asshole rule. I don't get to be an asshole and neither do you if you want to be in my life. And it's so 
helpful to be goal directed, know what you want, and then go, does my behavior fit? And sugar is an abusive food, it makes you fat and diabetic and it's pro-inflammatory and it's like, I love it, but it doesn't love me. So we had to break up. When was the last time that your doctor spent an hour with you listening to you and trying to really understand what your goals are? And when did you actually leave the doctor's office knowing exactly what your treatment plan was and what your go next steps are? At my practice, Rena Malik, MD, I aim to do just that. I specialize in sexual dysfunction, bladder problems, hormone management, and pelvic pain. And I want to revolutionize how we take care of patients and get to know each and every one of you. That's why when you come to my practice, I'm 100% present with you for an entire hour. There's no one else involved in your care. It is entirely you and me. And if for some reason you want to ask me a question between visits or you forgot to ask me a question, you can message me at any time with a guaranteed response with no extra hidden fees or costs associated with messages or any other communication that we have. And you don't even have to call the office to make an appointment. You can do it all easily online at www.renamalikmd.com slash appointments. I see patients in Newport Beach and Los Angeles, California. I also see patients for telemedicine visits who are located in the states of California, New York, New Jersey, Maryland, Texas, Florida, Illinois, and Virginia. And if you're not located in those states, I can still see you for an educational visit where we can talk about your condition as well as what treatment options exist so that you can take that information to your doctor and discuss what you think is the best option for you. I can't wait to see you. Yeah, you, you brought up a good point. You said, when I'm thinking about my wife, my goal is to have a good relationship with my wife. And sometimes these rude thoughts come up. And as someone who talks to people about their relationships a lot, you know, people think that relationships are always supposed to be perfect, right? Like you have always these loving thoughts to your partner, <laughs> but you have to make choices <laughs> to actually ignore the negative thoughts and look for the positive thoughts, right? Well, I collect penguins, and it's weird, I know, but I'm a psychiatrist, so I allow myself to be weird. <laughs> um, goodness, almost 40 years ago, I adopted my oldest son, and he was hard for me. He tended to be argumentative and oppositional. And, um, and I was a child psychiatry fellow at the time, so I didn't know anything. I'm just learning. And I told my supervisor that, you know, I don't like him. And she goes, you're not spending enough time with him. And so she gave me some strategies and I took him to a place. Um, I did my fellowship at the University of Hawaii and Tripler Army Medical Center in, in Honolulu. And so I took my son to Sea Life Park that Saturday. We went, and it's sort of like SeaWorld. Mm -hmm. um, and we went to the whale show and that was great. And then we went to the sea lion show and that was awesome. And then the dolphin show. But at the end of the day, we went to the penguin show and his name was Fat Freddy. And he was a humble penguin, chubby. That's why he's called Fat Freddy. And he comes onto the stage, climbs a diving board, a high dive, goes to the edge, bounces and then jumps in the water. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> and then he got out, bowled with his nose, countered with his flipper, jumped through a fire. And I have my arm around my son and we're having a really good day. And then the trainer asked Freddie to go get something. He went and got it and he brought it right back. And I went, damn, I asked this kid to get something for me and he wants to have a discussion. Mm -hmm. And I knew my son was smarter than the penguin. So I got it. <laughs> the problem's not with my son, it's with me. And I went to the trainer afterwards and I said, how did you get Freddie to do all these really cool things? And she said, unlike parents, whenever he does anything like what I want him to do, I notice him, I give him a hug and I give him a fish. And even though my son didn't like raw fish. My <laughs> daughter actually does. Yeah. <laughs> so she was sushi from the time she was two. 
She mm-hmm. loved sushi, so it totally would have worked with her. But I realized that when he did what I wanted him to do, because I was like my own father, I wasn't paying attention. Mm-hmm. I was busy. And so I collect penguins as a way to remind myself to notice what I like about other people more than what I don't like. And so for the women you see in your practice, every day they're shaping their partner by what they notice. And if they're just noticing the negative, that's usually all they're going to get back. Or if somebody just notices the negative about me, I shut down or I go away. Yeah. Yeah. No, and that's so that's the issue in long-term relationships very often is that there becomes a lot of relationship concerns because one person doesn't feel seen or heard in a positive way. In my case, it's always about sexual dysfunction where, you know, they're complaining that maybe their female partner has low desire, they have high desire or vice versa, and they they're struggling because they're like, well, what's wrong with that person? But it's a relationship issue, right? There is a relationship problem there. But also, you know, there can be, of course, hormonal issues and brain issues that affect desire. So I wanted to talk a little bit about if hormones are all normal, what are some things that we can do with our brains that can help us rediscover that desire? Well, you know, thinking of hormones, one of the wild cards that most people never think of is traumatic brain injury, past concussions. I did the big NFL study at a time when the NFL was sort of lying. They had a problem Mm -hmm. with traumatic brain injury in football. And I saw, uh, so I've scanned and treated over 400 NFL players, high levels of damage, high levels of erectile dysfunction low levels of testosterone. Why would these mountain men, Mm -hmm. if you will, I mean, great shape, huge, muscular, have low testosterone levels? Because the concussions they have damage the pituitary gland. Mm -hmm. And the pituitary gland is not sending the right signals. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's devastating for their wives because their wives think, well, he's not interested in me. There's something wrong with me. And they mm-hmm. don't know it's because he has super low testosterone levels. And, yeah. and I'm seeing low testosterone levels in so many young people. And I think concussions, one of the issues. I think the other issue is the toxins that people put on their body, the things that are called hormone disruptors. And you're like, oh. So I have all of my patients download the app Think Dirty so they can scan the products they're going to put on their body and see whether or not they're being poisoned. Well, I think sunscreen is is important because melanoma is a really serious cancer and we have to protect But it hasn't gone down. Now, I'm not saying sunscreen's not important, but get sunscreen that is made with healthy ingredients as opposed to unhealthy like covid completely freaked me out as people put hand sanitizer they went crazy with the unhealthiest cheapest hand sanitizers and they're getting all of those chemicals in their body and the problem is not that we have high vitamin d levels and we get vitamin d from the sun Mm -hmm. the people who died from covid had low vitamin d levels and as a society i don't know if you regularly check it on your patients i do like eight out of 10 people are low. Yeah, and And I think part of it is our lifestyle, right? People are going from their indoor homes to their cars where they're not getting enough true sunlight to their indoor workplace, right? And so they're not getting sun exposure as they should in general, but yes. And then certain people obviously need more vitamin D than others based on their melanin and things like that. So yeah, we're definitely severely deficient in vitamin D, but then we do know that chronic sun exposure, tanning beds, those things are, um, you know. Yeah, not not a good idea, but having a reasonable dose of the sun i mean we evolved in the sun yeah or um were made in the sun and it's it's been a very recent phenomenon to get out of the sun um 
And but you're right. And a lot of people actually don't know if you have really dark skin um, and you move to a climate with really low sun, like if you go from the Caribbean to Great Britain, you're much more likely to have a psychotic episode. The low vitamin D levels, they're just associated with virtually every bad thing. Yeah, in fact, there was a recent study, or maybe a couple years ago now, where they looked at vitamin D levels linked with overactive bladder. And I was like, oh, so it's like literally and, and overactive mean? bladder. Overactive and bladder. And so, oh, how interesting. Yeah, so I mean, I think there's more to the story than just, um, than, than, uh, than brain health, but like a lot of different things. I mean, overactive bladder is sort of complex and there's definitely brain components associated with some of those symptoms. But I think... Um, I wonder if that's psychophysiologic at all. There's definitely, um, you know, we know that when people are stressed, they have more overactive bladder symptoms, but they also get more tense pelvic floors because of it. And so there's sort of a lot of um, moving parts there that can all affect uh, affect your urinary symptoms. But uh, certainly there's, there's a lot to be discovered, I think, still in that space. There's so much psychological trauma from urinary dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So much yeah. that I've seen. It's sad. It's it's actually really, really sad. It, it When I see my patients struggling, it takes a toll on me, right? Because I see them, they can't do the things they used to enjoy. They are isolated. They don't want to be intimate with their partners. I mean, there's a lot that happens when you're having bladder issues that can be really traumatic. You, you know, thinking of psychiatry and sex, one of the surprising things for me is women who have ADD or attention deficit disorder, short attention span, distractibility, disorganization, procrastination, impulse control issues. It's very common and often underdiagnosed. So it may be overdiagnosed in boys, underdiagnosed in girls, because girls are generally not the behavior disorders mm -hmm. and they don't bring the negative attention to mm -hmm. themselves, how women get diagnosed with ADD is they bring their sons to get mm -hmm. evaluated. Yeah. But what does an orgasm require? Attention. Attention. Mm -hmm. Got to pay attention to the feeling long enough to sort of make it happen. And because they get so easily distracted, they have trouble yeah. having an orgasm. And I found when I treat their ADD, their partners get really happy because their partner thinks, well, she's not having an orgasm because of me, right? There's so much emotional stuff that goes on when you're making love um, that I often find, you know, we talk about the timing of taking your medicine and the mm. timing of your intimate relationships. And, you know, I also found because they get distracted, um, it really can interfere with intimacy. Mm -hmm. And because intimacy is way more than an orgasm. It's like, is somebody paying attention yeah. to you? Is it's someone like listening and not talking over you, which is a common ADD symptom? Yeah, or even just being able to enjoy the intimacy, right? right? And not thinking about the hundred other things you have to do, um, but being like, okay, I can make time for this. Um, you know, the other thing I've been thinking about lately is how do people, I mean, you've talked about social media and uh, being accessible to social media being dangerous for some people in terms of screen time and how it affects our brains. But what about dating apps? Like people are using dating apps to find their partners. How do you think that plays a role? So I was actually on the Dr. Oz show once and we did a whole show on dating apps in the brain. And so we did an experiment and I scanned people while they were on apps. And there's a small percentage of the population that people like them. And so I don't know if it's swipe right or swipe left. <laughs> it's been a long time. Um, but when they were getting it, the, the attention they wanted on the dating app, the happy part of their brain, the left frontal lobe lit up. 
But most of the people, they're not really getting what they want. And the negative side of their brain would light up. And when so many of my patients, they meet people through so through dating apps. I'm like, just got to think of it like a job. Give yourself a defined period of time. Take the time, mm -hmm. right? Because it's really how people meet yeah. other people today. I said, take the time, be serious, but limited. So it doesn't become an obsession. Yeah, it can, it can definitely spiral. Do you think it changes the way we perceive partners? Like there's so much that goes into finding someone attractive that's not just looking at their picture right there's like pheromones and um the just physical connection with that person do you think it's changing the way that we're able to connect with people it is but it's inevitable and so i think figure out how it works for you but also know what kind of person you are um there's fascinating research um on are you monogamous or are you not monogamous and um, there's actually, they did research on voles, which are sort of like prairie dogs. And there are prairie voles and montane voles. So prairie voles, if they have sex with another vole, it's the only vole they ever want to have sex with again. Even if that vole dies, 80% of the time, they're done. Really? Yeah. And then there's something called montane voles. They're all very cute. If they have sex with another montane bull, it doesn't matter to them if that's the next bull they have sex with. So they're one night stand artists. So you want to know who you are. You know, are you monogamous? Then before you sleep with someone, you sort of need to know a bit about their history. Mm -hmm. Because if they're a one night stand artist, you absolutely don't want to sleep with them because it's going to break your heart. Yeah. And so I wrote a book um, many years ago called The Brain in Love. And there's actually a whole chapter on how to screen people, you know, how to use <laughs> your head before you give your heart away. Um, and uh, I think it's just so important to be thoughtful about who you allow in your physical space. And you've been vocal that you scanned your wife's brain before you kind of dedicated yourself to her. How can people who are really serious about <laughs> their partners sort of, who don't have access to maybe, you know, or the means to do imaging, what can they do? Like, how can they really assess their partner's fit for them? And also, you know, kind of, are they gonna make it through the long run? Yeah, so if you date any of my children for more than four months, I scan you. <laughs> it's just part of the lore in my family. Um, because ultimately, your brain, physical function of your brain controls everything you do. And when I met my wife 19 years ago, um, I really liked her. And I'm like, you haven't seen the clinic. This was like three weeks into our dating. <laughs> you haven't seen the clinic. Don't you want to come see the clinic? And she's a neurosurgical ICU nurse. And she's very interested in what I do. Um, she's like, yeah. So I scanned her and passed. Um, I think it's so important not to be desperate. Not Because as humans, we want to be connected. And just take time to get to know somebody. Take time first to get to know yourself. Like, what do I want? What are my values? What's important to me? And not lie to yourself. Because new love is like cocaine. It's just like you've been hit with cocaine, a dopamine hit, and you start making bad decisions. So just own that it's a vulnerable time for you and go, what do I want? And does this fit and nobody's perfect you're probably not perfect i'm certainly not perfect but this is the one decision you want to be pretty selfish about and just selfish in does it fit does this person fit what i really think i need how does one pass a brain scan you said she passed what does that mean to you it was healthy okay i mean and 
Yeah. I can tell from a scan if you're going to torture me or not. If I hurt your feelings, will you hold on to it for 20 years? That pattern. And uh, people can, I developed a brain health assessment. People can take it for free. It's online, brainhealthassessment.com. It'll tell you which of the 16 brain types you have. Are you balanced? spontaneous which they're really fun but they make you crazy over time persistent they'll hold a grudge forever sensitive you'll hurt their feelings easily cautious they'll always be early to an appointment so knowing that brain type can be helpful right in in having a more fruitful and uh collaborative relationship right yeah even you said vulnerability in relationships, but I think sex is the most complete vulnerable act with someone because you have to be willing to communicate about your needs and and still provide pleasure to the other person. It's so true. And, you know, I think the more mature people get, the better their communication is and realize it's just a form of play. And, uh, and can you talk about it? And what a lot of women do, and, and I hate to generalize, but I actually did research. I published this study on 46,000 scans, looking at the difference between the male and the female brain, and they're wildly different. Um, is guys have a short attention span and they forget. You want to teach them what you want, and then you want to do it again. It's like, how do boys learn how to shoot free throws? They do thousands of them. Yeah, <laughs> It's like, reinforce it. But often, women will say something, and they'll expect that their partner heard it, and when they don't react in the way they like, they withhold, or they get quiet, and they're not reinforcing, it's like, you got to say it five times. And reinforce it, now do it in a kind way, yeah. right? If you're, and don't take it personally. If you're mean, <laughs> that will not work. Do it in a kind way, but do it repeatedly until they get it right and just keep reinforcing it. Yeah, I always tell people, you got to talk about sex, but it's not going to happen in one conversation. Right. You got to do it multiple times, not in the bedroom, and just really realize that no one knows how to talk about sex. It's super uncomfortable for a lot of people, and give them grace, you know? Love that. Um, you know, in terms of brain health, having a healthy brain, what are signs that your brain is going down the path of becoming unhealthy or maybe unhealthy? What can people look for in themselves or their loved ones that can tell them, hey, this is a red flag. I need to change something about my life. So if your memory is worse than it was 10 years ago, a lot of people think that's normal, but 80% of the time it's going to continue to get worse. So it, it may be normal, but it's not optimal. Mm -hmm. um, if you're decisions are not as good as they used to be or your attention is not as good or you find you're more irritable than you should all of those are signs of brain trouble if you get lost did you know we're diagnosing alzheimer's disease five years later than we did 30 years ago really and it's because of smartphones it's when I was a young psychiatrist, I would get calls. It's like my dad called me crying. He's lost in a city he's lived in for 30 years. And now that never happens because people go, hey, Siri, take me home. So it's undiagnosed. So we're getting the diagnosis later. And when does treatment work? Really, really early or late, early, mm -hmm. right? The earlier you get something, the more you can impact it. So look for changes in how you think, decisions are not as good, how you feel, depression is often a prodrome for dementia. So if someone's never been depressed and all of a sudden went they're 60 and they're 
depressed and it's not because they lost their spouse or whatever, that can actually be a warning sign of dementia. Did you know that we're now seeing patients not only in Newport Beach, but also in Beverly Hills, Los Angeles? If you want to see me in person and you're located in the LA County area, make an appointment today at www.renamalikmd.com slash appointments. Again, that's www.renamalikmd.com slash appointments. Looking forward to seeing you. You know, speaking of losing your spouse, I think in the elderly patients, and I I worry about this for our younger generation as I think marriage rates are going down, but loneliness is a true problem. Just this week, I saw, I work at the veterans hospital. I saw a patient who was telling me how he doesn't leave the house anymore because all of his friends have died. And I said, look, you have to go out and at least connect with the grocery store person or the coffee person. Like you need human connection. But what do you, you know, what do you make of that? How do you tell people to avoid loneliness? And we know that people die sooner because they're lonely. Right. It's an epidemic. It's one of the major risk factors for Alzheimer's disease and depression. Um, and, And it's connection, whether you can find it at church and volunteering. So I'm not a huge fan of retirement. It's, uh, no, you have to have purpose. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can retire if you can afford it, but then make sure you're doing something you love that involves other people. Yeah. You've obviously, you're notorious. You've scanned 250,000, probably more than that now, brains. And you, Notorious is a good word. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that's pretty tremendous. But you published about it in the early 90s, right? So why are people not catching on? Like why are around the country this is still not accepted by you know national guidelines like what's going on there well interestingly um speaking about happiness in 2021 um the canadian association of nuclear medicine Mm -hmm. produced procedure guidelines on spec as if i wrote them and Hmm. so more people are doing it but not nearly like they should why Um, Thomas Kuhn wrote a book in 1962 called The Structure of Scientific Revolution. In 1991, when I first started ordering scans, I'm like, I should invest in these camera companies because this is so cool. And psychiatry desperately needs an upgrade, right? Psychiatrists are the only medical doctors who never look at the organ they treat. Think about that. As a urologist, would you ever like do a treatment plan just based on symptoms? You're going to do an exam. You're going to look at the organ you treat. Um, And in 1992, there were all day lectures on brain spec imaging at the American Psychiatric Association. But by 1998, they sort of went, no, it's not helpful because it doesn't validate the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And in fact, it doesn't. It's sort of, that book becomes irrelevant when you start looking at psychiatry through the lens of imaging. Because there's nothing in the DSM about brain health. Your brain is an organ like your heart is an organ. Get it healthy. So Thomas Kuhn says there's five steps, I think, to radical change because what i do is radical Mm -hmm. change and he says first there's just the status quo second somebody notices a problem i give prozac to one person they get dramatically better i give it to someone with the same symptoms and now they want to kill themselves i'm like we have a problem Mm -hmm. um third comes up with a new paradigm Maybe it's not mental health, it's brain health. Mm -hmm. Fourth, the most consistent stage is the rejection. Especially if it hurts people's pocketbooks, like insurance companies or pharmaceutical companies. And because this new model that I created, it's not friendly. Even though I'm like, it'll totally save you money, Mm -hmm. but you'll use less medicine because you'll get people's brains healthy rather than think of the current model of psychiatry you start 
Prozac or Lexapro or whatever, mm -hmm. you don't stop it. Um, pharmaceutical companies are not in the order business. They're in the reorder mm -hmm. business. And the model I've created is like, no. I mean, we'll use medicine if necessary, but it's never the first and it's never the only thing we think about. Um, so I've lived through the rejection and then the last step is the acceptance. And I think on this from one to five, where are we? I think we're like at 4.7. So many people understand that mental health treatment today is a shit show. Um, quarter of the population is on psychiatric meds, but the incidence of psychiatric problems is continuing to escalate. That's, um, that's a shocking statistic. And I think that you would have to be really mentally strong to have gone through all that criticism. Being as someone who was raised in the traditional medical model, it, that can be traumatic, like that sort of backlash from colleagues. And for a long time, it was incredibly hard. But um, I have deep faith. And whenever I get creamed by my colleagues, there's always a story of transformation that keeps me strong. Because I know I'm right. I mean, not everything I think is right. Sure. But I know psychiatry should add imaging and natural ways to heal the brain. And we need to get rid of the term mental illness. I wrote a whole book called The End of Mental Illness. The psychiatry shames people, diminishes people, will label you as borderline personality disorder. What does that mean? You're really messed up and I'm not likely to be helpful. <laughs> like, or intermittent explosive disorder. Like, what does that mean? It means you have a terrible temper. Um, with no biological data. Um, we need to end the current paradigm and create a new one based on neuroscience and hope, which is you're awesome, but your brain could be better. And I think if we're going to end mental illness, we're going to develop a cardiology model where, you know, most people see cardiologists have never had a heart attack. Mm -hmm. They're Prevention. there to prevent it. Mm -hmm. I see a day where if we're going to end mental illness, we have to develop a similar way of thinking where we know the brain's risk factors, like teenagers who sleep just an hour less than their peers, have a higher incidence of depression and suicide. So even in the state of California, you can't start school before 8 o'clock now. Well, how smart is that, mm -hmm. right? Because it's forcing schools to honor Sleep, right? They used to have these zero periods where yeah. kids would get up. And it's a normal circadian rhythm. Teenagers' circadian rhythm starts at like 10, 11 o'clock, right? It's not eight, right. even 8 o'clock, but it's better than 7 a.m., which is what I did when I was in high school. Yeah. I think for me, gr growing up, I'm one of seven. Um, I was sort of irrelevant. I had an older brother um, who beat me up a lot that I sort of learned how to deal with rejection and criticism and but still have my own mind mm -hmm. and, uh, so for people i mean i think a lot of the reason that it hasn't taken off would be that insurance doesn't pay for it right um for for imaging for people but and it does sometimes it sometimes. just depends on your plan yeah. and how the doctor orders it. Got it. Like I had never ordered for psychiatric things. I'm looking for how are your frontal lobes, how mm -hmm. are your temporal lobes. Yeah. And then it's costly. And that is prohibitive for a lot of people. The average American probably can't afford it if it's not covered by insurance. Yeah. So I, don't, I don't buy that just because they can afford a car. They can afford to send their kids to college. They could afford a house payment they don't see it as investing in their brain health, which will pay you back over and over and over, right? Mm -hmm. What does it cost to have an unhealthy brain? Hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe more of the years. I gave a lecture in Arizona. I have a new clinic in Scottsdale. And, and I went through the cost of what we do. And I went through, okay, here's 
the cost of what we do. So a whole evaluation at our clinic, which is two scans, neuropsych testing, a history, the first follow-up is about $5,000. And after the lecture, father came up to me. He said that $5,000 saved me $100,000 because I was my son was going to go to a residential treatment facility. But we stopped him from going to the residential treatment facility because his son learned to love his brain. We had the map so we could actually do the right plan. So, you know, we don't just see wealthy people at our 11 clinics. We see people from all over the spectrum. We actually have a foundation that helps raise money for people who can't afford treatment. Um, but a long time ago, I learned not everybody's getting a scam. Mm -hmm. so that's why I've written 40 books. I'm like always trying to give away what I've learned. Yeah. And ultimately, it's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. Love your brain. Nobody loves their brain. Why? Because you can't see it. You can see the wrinkles in your skin or the fat around your belly. You can do something when you're unhappy with it. But when you see your brain, oh my goodness, you fall in love. And it's like, I want that better. Yeah. And then avoid things that hurt it. Know the list. Our society is not for us, right? Alcohol is health food. It's complete crap. The mm -hmm. American Cancer Society, of all people, came out against any alcohol because yeah. they said any alcohol increases the risk of seven different types of cancer. But if you watch the Super Bowl, brain damage in sport, there will be 30 alcohol commercials, right? And then... Carl's Jr. will take a half-naked woman, like a really good-looking woman, like Charlotte McKinney, and put that cheeseburger in her face. And you know she's not eating the cheeseburger. But it's the subliminal messages that if you eat that cheeseburger, she's going to want you. And she's not no. going to want you. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of money that sells a lot of unhealthy things, a lot. I mean, if you think of, someone posted recently, all these celebrities who had made so much, bil almost billionaires because of alcohol companies, alcohol companies. It's crazy how much alcohol sells that people become billionaires by owning an alcohol brand. Well, Bella Hadid uh, publicly one of my patients and she created a non-alcoholic drink company, uh, Ken Euphorics. And I was at the press opening and one of the reporters wrote a hate piece on me because I helped her stop drinking and then she developed this and, and I'm like, controversial psychiatrist. And I'm like, well, at least they're writing about me, I suppose. <laughs> Are you loving the Rena Malik MD podcast? Well, I love each and every one of you, and I'm truly honored that you choose to spend a bit of your day or a bit of your week with me. Did you ever hear the actual story of why I started making content online? Well, when I was a resident, I remember having a patient who had bladder cancer, and in order to treat her bladder cancer, we had to remove it and then reconstruct a new bladder called an Indiana pouch. Now, with this new bladder, she would have to catheterize herself through a stoma or an opening on her abdomen in order to empty her bladder. So after surgery, immediately she did great. She went home and no major issues. But subsequently, over the next couple months, she started getting readmitted over and over again to the intensive care unit. And we were really wondering what was going on. Eventually, we figured out that she didn't truly understand that she now had to catheterize herself to empty her bladder. Just the simplest thing that was so pivotal, she didn't understand that. And it was then that I realized as a urologist, I could do the perfect surgery. But if my patient didn't understand the consequences of that surgery, then I failed as their doctor. And once I started practice, I realized that I couldn't teach people everything they needed to know in the 15 or 30 minutes I saw them in my office. And that's when I started creating all my Rena Malik MD content to offer free education to people around the world. And I can tell you that it has been truly one of the most rewarding experiences in my life. And in order to keep providing free content, we need your help. If you are getting value 
out of this podcast or my other content, I encourage you to join our premium membership. As a member, you'll get early access to the audio and video of the podcast completely ad-free, transcripts of all the episodes, and exclusive access to Ask Me Anything episodes that occur once a month. And during those episodes, I answer questions that are asked only by premium members. So join us today at renamalik.supercast.com. Can't wait to see you there. Um, you know, you said something uh, that really stuck with me, which was um, mentally strong people do nice things for people that give them respect. I think that is so meaningful. And I just want you to expand on that a little bit because I think so many of us, people in general, spend too much time on people that don't give them respect and that don't give them what they deserve because maybe they think they're not worthy or maybe they just are people pleasers or whatever. But I think if people took that mantra to heart, their lives would be significantly better. I only do nice things for people I feel treat me with respect. Boy, that's a mantra that you'll raise really healthy kids if you do that. If your child throws a tantrum and you just give them their way, you've just reinforced bad behavior. And it's it, like that in every area of life. Yeah. But we ignore adult tantrums. Or we, we, we accept and allow adult tantrums more than we would our kids, I think. I only do nice things for people I feel treat me with respect. So I want to talk about something a bit controversial, uh, switch gears a little bit, but I think ADHD and ADD have really potential significant implications in focus, in relationships, in work productivity. So should we be screening people for these things at young ages? Like, should we be screening all kids? for ADD and ADHD, you know, is there, would we be having a better society if we treated people who had these conditions? You know, it depends on your treatment model. If we start giving Ritalin and Adderall to every distracted kid without really looking at their diet, their level of exercise, their vitamin D level, um, their ferritin, their thyroid, um, we'd create a lot of trouble. But if we actually screen people for ADD or ADHD, it's just different term for the same thing, mm -hmm. different versions of the DSM. Um, and we treated it holistically, effectively, which sometimes does mean medicine, society would be dramatically better because untreated ADD creates a lot of societal problems from divorce, incarceration, bankruptcy, um, abuse. Uh, untreated ADD is a huge part of that. Because I think it's one of those conditions that can go under the radar, right? You can go through life, you can become an adult, you can just be cantankerous or have other, you know, issues throughout your life, but like, you can go unnoticed, and you can just be unhappy, because you're dealing struggling. And more often in women than in men. Um, and I actually wrote this in a chart yesterday. Untreated ADD leads to depression. Because with ADD, what we see on scans, we do two, one at rest, one when you concentrate, is their concentration scan tends to drop in activity. So what does that mean? It means the harder you try, the worse it gets. And uh, my first scan ever, 1991, I went to a lecture on brain spect imaging given by the chief of medicine at our hospital. And... I go out of the lecture into the room of Sandy, a new patient. She's 40 years old. She tried to kill herself the night before. And as we were talking, as I'm getting to know her, I'm thinking she has adult ADD. And she has an eight-year-old son that has it. She has an IQ of 140, but never finished college. I asked her how she studied. She goes, well, I mostly never did until the night before an exam, then I'd stay up all night, 
like classic ADD way of doing it. She tried to kill herself in an impulsive thing after a fight with her husband where she was picking on him. And I'm like, ADD, 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 ADD. I'm like, I think we should look at this. And she goes, oh, adults can't have ADD. And I'm like, who's the doctor here? <laughs> but I'm like, let me study your brain. Yeah. And and I knew then, because I'd been doing some work with EEG before then, that ADD is not a disorder of a resting brain. It's a disorder of a working brain. So I scanned her at rest, and she had a very healthy brain. And then I had her do a series of concentration tasks and then scanned her then. And her frontal lobes just dropped like a rock. I mean, it was very impressive. And I put the scans on her, the table in her hospital room, and as I explained that to her, she started to cry. And she said, you mean it's not my fault? That was the pivotal moment I fell in love with imaging. You mean it's not my fault? And I wear glasses to drive. I said, no. I said, you know, having ADD is sort of like people need glasses. People need glasses aren't dumb, crazy, or stupid. Their eyeballs are shaped funny. I wear glasses so I can focus. You're not dumb, crazy, or stupid, but your frontal lobes drop when they should turn on, and I think you should let me treat your ADD because you're clearly ADD. Dramatic improvement. Her mood got better. She wasn't on an antidepressant. Her relationship with her husband was better. Her relationship with the kids was better. She went back to school. She finished her degree. That's and amazing. she was no longer underemployed because if you think about it, if you can't focus... Well, you don't really like school that much because mm -hmm. it's not fun mm -hmm. and you're underemployed. In fact, on average, people who have ADD compared to their peers make $10,000 less. So when we're talking about the cost of an evaluation, you know, it pays for itself within a year. And uh, yeah, it's so important to understand and treat effectively but you know i have a slide when i lecture on what makes add worse screen time makes add worse not sleeping makes add worse captain crunch and <laughs> frosted flakes and cocoa puffs and sugar breakfasts they make add worse and having low levels of omega-3 fatty acids or low iron is very common I see low ferritin levels in my patients. Yeah. So getting your <clears throat> diet right, getting your exercise right, all of that helps. And then if you need medicine, then everybody's sort of ready for it. But so many parents come in, oh, I never give my child medicine. And I'm like, but you would give them glasses if they needed glasses, right? Sort of neglect not to give them glasses if they need it. I mean, right, let's always do the natural things but your brain can have problems just like your heart can have problems. And you would think it's sort of abusive not to give a child heart medicine. Yeah. So I want to end with a few questions from our audience. One was for people who are chronically sleep deprived. Now we know that's horrible for our brain. How quickly or how fast can they improve if they start sleeping better? A couple of weeks. Their brain will be better. I mean, the next day their brain will be better, but a couple of weeks we can really show it as better. That's great. And um, in terms of emotional trauma, how do people, we know that affects the brain negatively. We know it affects, at least in my world, it affects your sex life negatively. Um, it affects so many things negatively. But how can people begin to heal that trauma so they can have better function in those areas? Well, be honest with themselves about it. I do a treatment called EMDR. It's a specific psychological treatment for trauma. It stands for eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. I love it. One of the most effective treatments for past trauma. But what I have my patients do is I have them do a life history. Like every five years, I want you to write down what stressful things happen, but also what awesome things happen. I never want you to go down the rabbit hole of trauma without doing it in a balanced way. Mm -hmm. And 
if you do that, you'll begin to see themes in your life, like the times I've been attacked by my colleagues. I mean, it was very traumatic for me. And, you know, went back to other traumas I had. Making sure I deal with that means I can keep doing the work that I love, right? So catalog the trauma so you're aware of it. Because too often pain, especially chronic pain, is your brain's way of distracting you from the trauma. Mm -hmm. But I think better to go into it than cover it up and then get professional help. It can be so helpful. Yeah, absolutely. I think getting help, professional help is so important. Uh, you're not... And it's an investment, right? Right. It's like getting a scan. But you know what I often, I work with a lot of psychologists, but one, Earl Henslin, um, he always sends people for scans first because he goes, we are going to do software programming on your brain. That's what psychotherapy is. I want to make sure you don't have hardware problems. Yeah. Because <laughs> if you have hardware problems, the psychological problems or the software problems aren't going to take. Yeah. So um, I want to be respectful of your time. We have a few questions we ask everybody. Um, what is your non-negotiable, something that you have to do every day? Sleep. Like I don't take red-eye flights because I know if I don't sleep, I'm more likely to make a bad decision. Mm -hmm. I take my supplements every day. I stretch every day. I work on walking or riding the bike every day. What's wh and, and I'm really nice to my wife because, yeah, I'm really nice to my wife. So I want to ask you about your wife because you've been married for 19 years, you said, and obviously a very loving relationship. What tips do you have for people outside of keep, obviously pay attention to the important and loving things they do? Be intentional. I mean, I think that's so important. What do you want? I want kind, caring, loving, supportive, passionate relationship always want that don't always feel like that so i guard this is why i'm not a fan of alcohol so many of the problems i have as a psychiatrist with my patients they said stupid things because they had too much to drink and the brain has memory and so you know some things you just can't take back really yeah so having a guard over your frontal lobe so you don't say every stupid thing you think. Now, I just finished a huge study on adverse childhood experiences. So I don't know if you give your patients the ACE questionnaire, mm -hmm. but boy, it'll be informative for you. Adverse childhood experiences, zero to 10, how many do you have? I'm a one, my wife's an eight. And I knew how much I really liked her. My first gift to her was 10 sessions of EMDR because I'm like, this will help you. Now, she ended up going for two years and I'm convinced it's one of the reasons we're kind to each other. I mean, not always. There was this kitchen table we couldn't agree on. <laughs> Those are smart Our things. kids were like, really? <laughs> this, is, this is the issue. <laughs> That's funny. Um, if there's one thing you could change about the world, um, and there's many, but pick your most important, what would it be? Well, in my book, The End of Mental Illness, I wrote, if I was an evil ruler and I wanted to create mental illness, what would I do? And there's 62 evil ruler strategies. And I also imagine if I was a good ruler, what would I do? I'd have brain health education multiple times throughout elementary school, middle school, and high school. You love your brain, you'll love your life. Yeah, there's so much I wish we did in elementary school and middle school that, you know, they're very focused on curriculum, and that's sort of from a state level. But, you know, from my end, like, I see so many things, like sexual education is not taught People don't know how their bodies work. They don't know how they should work. They learn from pornography rather than learning from their parents Which is, or from eight-year-olds are addicted to it's pornography horrible. because it's parents horrible. aren't doing a good job of supervising what goes into the brains of young people. Um, the longer you can delay 
devices, the better your kids are going to be. The yeah. American Academy of Pediatrics recommends no screens until they're at least three. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's like, I think our generation, my, my generation included of parents, it's always been there. Screens have always been there for our kids. And it's like they're babysitters, right? Like, no, I need a break. I got to give my kid a screen. But it's not healthy, right? They, they they're are, addictive. Yeah, they really are. And, which means they're wearing out the pleasure centers in their brain. That's a very bad thing. Because if you wear out the pleasure center in your brain, you're now at risk for drug abuse. You're now at risk for depression. You're now at risk to have screen-induced ADD. Yes, and it's sad. I see a lot of young men now with erectile dysfunction, a lot. And a lot of it is because of what happens in the bedroom doesn't look like what they see on pornography, and they have unrealistic expe expectations of themselves and their partner, and it leads to true you know, problems with them being able to get erections because they feel like something's wrong. And then they really think something's wrong. And it just is a Which vicious cycle. Which only perpetuates. Because yeah. if you get a negative thought during sex, you'll lose your erection. Yep, and then you're like, oh, I'm, I am broken. Let me continue. Like, there is something wrong with me. And the next or time... Or they're not thinking about their partner. They're thinking about the girl in the video or the guy yeah. in the video. Yeah. Or they, you know, they think that it should look like that or be like that when that's a produced product, right? That's not real life. And those are people who are professional actors and actresses for whatever it's worth, you know? And they've they've trained themselves to do certain things. That's not normal. Um but yeah, it's it's a scary scary time. <laughs> last last question: What is one life hack or health hack that you would share with people? Well, one of my very favorite is um, finishing another study on conscious negativity bias, and it's associated it has its own brain signature, but it tends to predict almost every psychiatric illness. The more negative you are, the more vulnerable you are. So I love positivity bias training. Mm -hmm. Start every day with today is going to be a great day. Like say it to yourself, what are you looking forward to today? Throughout the day, look for the micro moments of happiness. Like what's the smallest thing that makes you happy? Um, but my favorite one is when you go to bed at night, I say a prayer, and then I go on a treasure hunt with what went well today. And I start at the beginning of my day, like when I wake up, and I go hour by hour looking for what was awesome about the day. And the negative stuff will show up, and I'm like, big broom, sweep it away, not the point, bedtime for what went well that's great if you do that for three weeks your level of happiness will go up uh, you know i forgot to ask you this earlier you mentioned somewhere that and you mentioned it i think multiple times but like being happy but be, being realistic versus being just happy go lucky and in fact being happy go lucky all the time those people die sooner is that right yeah, there's actually a big study they did at Stanford on 1,548 10-year-old children. They followed them for 90 years. Wow. And they looked, went, what goes with health, success, longevity? And the don't worry, be happy people died the earliest from accidents and preventable illnesses. So many patients come to see me and they go, I'm so anxious. I, I need you to help me lose my anxiety. And I'm like... Let's decrease it. So if you think of anxiety from zero to 100, we're not taking it to zero because those people die early. Let's get it to about 15. Do you have enough anxiety? You don't drive at 100 miles an hour in the rain and that you say no when people offer you alcohol and other drugs, um, but it's not torturing you. So I want you to have enough anxiety to help you do the right things and not too much that you suffer. That's great. 
Well, thank you so much. It's been well, a pleasure a having you, and it's been wonderful to get to know you. And I will uh, please let people know, again, your new book is coming out in March. What else you're working on and where they can find you? So Raising Mentally Strong Kids, March 26th. Um, I think follow me at Doc Amen on Instagram or TikTok or most places. Uh, and they can learn about the clinics at amenclinics.com or take the brain health assessment, know your brain type at brainhealthassessment.com. Great. Thanks so much. If you are enjoying this podcast, the best way you can say thanks to us is by sharing our podcast with your friends and family. Please give us a subscribe on YouTube and a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. It goes a long way in helping people discover our content so we can help people continue to learn, educate themselves, and become empowered for their own health. And as always, remember to take care of yourself because you're worth it.